This is the Collector Car Podcast, the home for the auto enthusiast. Join Greg Stanley as he applies over 25 years of insights and analytical experience to the collector car market. He will interview the experts and throw in some fun stuff as well. Hey everyone, it's Greg Stanley. I am going to do something interesting today. I'm going to review the 20 plus million dollar cars that are MIA, that are missing. And to do this... It's going to take a little bit, so sit back and relax. Well, before we begin, I do want to give a couple shout-outs to a couple listeners. Uh, first off, I'd like to give a special thanks to Chris from Dayton, Ohio. We ran into each other at a gas station break, he, and he wrote me a nice email. And what was so funny about his email is he kind of mentioned how the Keep Cash and Crush is such a difficult thing to listen to. So he suggested changing it to Keep Cash or Cart Away to Donate to Someone Who Likes That Sort of Stuff. <laughs> That's kind of a long title, and I appreciate his sentiment and where he's coming from, and it's just hypothetical, so none of these cars would actually be crushed, but I do feel your pain because the joy I get in making other people squirm, if I had to be on the other side of that question, I would squirm as well. The next one I'd like to to uh, recognize is Elaine from Kennebunkport, Maine. She is always one of the first persons to play the trivia game when I post on Instagram stories and Facebook stories. I post a trivia question related to our guest's answer for Keep Cash and Crush. It's not always which car did they crush or which car did they keep, but she is always the first to, or one of the first to try to win that prize, and she's won it one or two times. But I feel bad for you, Elaine, because sometimes you're just number three, four, or five, and you don't get to win the prize. So keep on trying. The next person is Phil Arnold. Phil, thanks for listening out of Fernandina Beach, Florida. Phil always gives me some nice comments and recommendations for the podcast. And then uh, the last is a is a listener from Denmark, Johannes. I hope I pronounced that correctly. This was really cool because back when Steve Volk was on from the Shelby, uh, Shelby American Collection, uh, he donated an autographed poster that uh, Johannes won. And I had to spend like $17 to ship it to Denmark, which I was more than happy to do. And uh, he sent me a picture back of him with the poster. So if you go to my Instagram feed at the Collector Car Pos- Podcast, you will see him in Denmark with his prize. And that was really cool because he has a really sweet 65 or 66 Mustang Fastback made to look like a GT, the dark green color. So like I said before, today we're talking about cars that are missing, that are still worth worth a lot of money. One of the reasons I wanted to do this episode was because recently, over the last two or three years, a couple of rare Mustangs have been quote unquote found. One of them was the Bullet Mustang from Steve McQueen's movie Bullet, and that wasn't really found. The folks always knew where it was. They just decided to make it public after so many years, and it sold for over $3.5 million at a Mecham auction, and or did it? Uh, I don't know, but publicly it did sell. And then another one is the Little Red Mustang that was uh, found recently as well. There were two Mustangs that were kind of Shelby prototypes. So basically, Shelby took two 67 coupes. Uh, the Green Hornet was the name of one. Little Red must, was the other. Excuse me. And they were made to uh, Shelby specs, but it was a coupe and not a fastback or a convertible. For 67, there was one convertible prototype, these two coupes, and then all the remaining actual production ones were fastback. So the Little Red was missing for many years. Uh, Barrett Jackson, uh, Craig Barrett, wait, Craig Jackson of Barrett Jackson, he found it eventually in, I think, Mexico or New Mexico and did a total restoration. I believe he has both of those now. So that's pretty cool. Anyways, so the fact that two cars, two Mustangs that had been MIA for ever were recently found, I thought I'd compile a list of other vehicles that are MIA and maybe they will be found in the future. So I'm going to go from the least valuable to the most valuable. So you have to stay until the end to find out which one's the most valuable. And I'm going to start with five honorable mentions. So these five did not hit the $1 million threshold to be in the final list of 20, but I thought they were pretty cool. So starting at the least value valuable would be the Partridge Family bus from the TV show, The Partridge Family. So this bus was apparently a 1957 Chevrolet Superior coach and let's see, the last known location was a Los Angeles scrapyard in 1987. So it's doubtful that this one survived, but maybe someone saw the color palette on that bus and they saved it. I seriously doubt that. But if it was 
If it was around today, what is it worth now? Now that's a tough one. You know, buses aren't worth a lot. If it came from a scrapyard, it's in pretty rough shape. I'm going to put a low ball price on it of four grand. So not a lot of folks are digging the Partridge family right now. Hopefully it would bring more if someone did find it. It definitely is iconic if you are a child from the early 70s. The next one is the 1958 Plymouth Fury from the movie Christine. Stephen King movie. I personally loved that movie when I saw it years and eons ago. The average Haggerty value for a 1958 Plymouth Fury non-movie car is almost $36,000. The most recent sale of a Plymouth Fury I could find actually was one of the movie cars from Christine, and it sold for $198,000. So this particular car sold at Cruise at uh, Auburn Spring in 1998 for 19 grand. And then by Barrett Jackson in Palm Beach in 2004 for $167,000. So that's a, a huge increase, almost a 10x return <clears throat> in just six years. And then recently, I think it was 2018, 2019, it sold for $198,000. Now, this one, let's see, there were 20 of them were created by the producers, but in the end, only four of them survived. Let's see, three of them were sold car collectors. And then one was found in a junkyard, and this guy bought it for 900 bucks and restored it. So apparently everyone knows where all of them are except for one of them that was sold into a collection in the U.K. That's the one that's missing. So the last known location was in the U.K. The date of that it was last seen was kind of unknown. And I put the ballpark around 195 grand as far as what it's worth now because Nobody's really clamoring for Christine <laughs> memorabilia. I haven't seen the movie for years, so I don't think there's a big following. So it'll probably sell for basically what the last one sold for. The next one, the third one in our uh, honorable mentions is the Renault from the movie, I'm sorry, from the Titanic. And they did a, a reproduction one for the movie. So let's see, one of those recently not related to the Titanic sold for $269,000. And apparently one went down on the Titanic in 1912. So the current location is on the bottom of the ocean's floor. And the date last seen was 1912. And I'm guessing it, even if you know they dragged it up as is in bits and pieces, it's probably only worth at, ma at the most $200,000. It is related to the Titanic, and people seem to freak over that kind of stuff. So it's, it's going to bring more than the Partridge bus but uh still i would pick it at two hundred thousand dollars now the fourth one in our honorable mentions is one of the back to the future deloreans so the average value for a delorean in the haggerty valuation tool is thirty four thousand seven hundred dollars the recent sales it turns out it was there was a movie car that sold recently for five hundred and forty one thousand dollars so half a million dollars so let's see a total of seven deloreans were built out of which only three managed to last until today two were two are used at universal studios at their different parks for public appearances uh let's see another one was auctioned off to a collector in california that's probably the one for half a million dollars uh one of the seven was crushed and two others were harvested for parts so the one that is missing was just a wrecked shell and it was suspended from the ceiling of planet hollywood in hawaii so since that restaurant closed. Nobody knows what happened to it. So the last known location was Planet Hollywood in Hawaii. The date of that was 2005. And it's a shell. Uh, so I want to put it at the 500, half a million dollar range, probably more like 300 to $350,000 because you could put the guts back on it, make it look like a real one. And it, it, is, it, it is a real quote unquote movie car. Now, the last one from an honorable mention perspective is one nobody talks about that I am super thrilled about, thinking they might actually be out there, is a 1969 Boss 429, which that is not rare in on itself. Actually, they're kind of rare. Uh, I think they made 499 in 69. But it's the only one that had a rear engine. So this is really crazy. So apparently Ford made a prototype called the LDI Mustang, and this was done by Carcraft, who built the Boss 429s. Now, this car, called the LID, is actually an acronym, which was short for Low Investment Drivetrain. So an experiment to produce a mid-engine Mustang on a budget. Because the big Boss 429 engine weighed a ton. I think the weight distribution was like 58% in the front, 
42% back. So they wanted to put the engine to the back in the back to increase traction to increase performance. When they did that, it basically just flipped it. Now it's 58% weight is in the back and 42% is in the front. Now what's really funny about this, the note was uh, there was zero improvement on performance by flipping it to the rear. And what was cool or weird or interesting is that to access the engine, you would actually pop open the rear glass. It was like a hatchback almost to access it. And they had it dressed up as a Mach 1, not as a Boss, which is weird. So if you look at Boss 429 prices, the average value is 180 grand. Recent sales have been around 320 to 335 for really nice examples. If you could actually find this original rear engine Boss 429, I would put the value at 750 to $900,000. The last place that one was seen was Detroit in 1969. So realistically, that one was probably crash, uh, crushed. Now, let's go to the list. So this is the top 20 cars that are over $1 million that are MIA. Actually, these are the, it just happened to be 20 cars. If there's more, let me know. I think I found all of the big dollar cars that are missing in this list. Now, the first one is the Bettencorp Zupan Coupe. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It's a hot rod. Uh, what's important about this one is it has a connection to some famous hot rodders. It was either the first or the second Chop Top 49 Mercury, which created the huge wave. So that's like a really big deal. A lot of big names are attached to this. Uh, let's see. It was out of use by the late 60s. It was sitting outside of a shop in 1970 when it just disappeared. So it last seen in California. Date was 1970. What's it worth now? Really hard to pin down. Hot rods are soft right now. Uh, even period correct ones. Um, I would put it 350 to 500 grand. That might be low, but uh, if you have a better crystal ball, just let me know. Now this next one is very exciting to me. It's a 1967 Shelby GT500 iconic car. Uh, the last of the real Shelby's, quote unquote, that Shelby had a, a part involved with, 427 big block engine. It's the only year that they had the dual quads on the uh, Ford big block. Average Haggerty value. Uh, that can't be right. So average Haggerty value of a 67 Shelby is probably around $180,000. Recent sales at 209 and 224. They've been soft recently. This is, I believe, night mist blue with white interior and white racing stripes, so it is very attractive. But what's really cool about this car is the one that's missing was owned by Jim Morrison of the Doors. I'm not a huge Doors fan, but that's kind of cool. It was gifted to him by Electra Records in celebration of the Doors' successful debut in 1967. Now, let's see. He left it outside. Oh, no, he wrecked it off of Sunset Boulevard. And he left it by the side of the road, and it was apparently it was impounded, and then he passed away, and it was sold to an unknown figure, very mysterious. So apparently several years ago, someone on a forum started asking about spare parts for Shelby, claiming she owned a deceased rock star's GT500, and those posts have since been deleted. Ooh, pretty exciting. So there's a chance that this one is still around. The last time it was seen was 1967 off of Sunset Boulevard. What's it worth now? So if a non-Jim Morrison Shelby is worth 200 grand in mint shape, 235, something like that, I would peg this at like 650 to 700 grand because there's some crazy people when it comes to the doors, and they would probably pay up for it. A super cool car by itself. I bet someone has that car and just has no idea. So if you're Kevin Marty, please run the report and let us know so we can solve this mystery. The next one is the Chevrolet Corvette, Corvette Nomad. Now, what's that? They did have the Chevrolet Nomad, which was a two-door wagon, but this is a Corvette Nomad. So this was one of the prototypes in the mid-1950s as part of the GM Motorama Traveling Car Show. It was one of those cars you know, that was saying could be something that came out in the future, uh, let's see, it was named the Waldorf Nomad since it first appeared at, Wal at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. So this one disappeared, probably went to the Crusher. There's no comps on this. Uh, I will tell you, a lot of those cars from the 50s, the 53 Motorama cars that did exist, that were the prototypes, they were selling 3 to $4 million. So I would peg this one somewhere around that. 1950s cars are declining right now, but this is a 1950s Corvette. 
It's a Motorama prototype. It's never been seen since the 50s, so I think it would be uh, it would go for pretty strong money. The next one is another one of those Motorama cars, but this one's even more iconic. Uh, the 1953 Buick Wildcat concept. So GM created just two of these masterpieces, uh, and I believe the one of them is still around in a museum. One white and one black. So the black one is the one that is has disappeared. Nobody knows where it is. It disappeared in the 1950s. Now this car is priceless, uh, but as I said before, it's probably rare. You know, I don't know. I'm kind of going to talk backwards here in a second. I would probably peg this around $2 million because Corvette is still around. Buick's not around. Wildcats are not around. I think it might bring a little less, even though it's in my mind, a more iconic car than the Chevrolet Corvette Nomad. I think the Nomad will bring more because it's a Corvette. All right, the next one's a 1933 Pierce Arrow Silver Arrow. Arrow. Uh, let's see, the last few that sold were 2.3 to 3.8 million dollars. The uh, Silver Arrows were, they only built five of them, and they were very expensive when new, about ten thousand dollars. These were halo cars for Pierce Arrow. So the story goes that one of the three known survivors was restored by Bill Hera, famous Hera collection. Um, after being pulled from a riverbed in Pennsylvania. Huh, interesting. Uh, let's see. All right, so apparently two of the five are missing. We don't know where they are or where they, when they were last seen or when they disappeared. So I would assume those are worth about $2.5 All right, our sixth of the 20 is the 1935 Duesenberg SJ number 560. So... Duesenberg made, I want to say, 26 SJ models. Now, this had a supercharged 320-horsepower engine. Uh, they made 26 of them, and there's one of them that's missing. So this is kind of easy to evaluate. The last ones that sold were about $4.5 million. Uh, this one was last seen in the 60s, so probably worth 4 to $6 million. The seventh one, I can't believe nobody's really talked about this one, it's a 19, I think, 60-ish Ferrari 250 GT Cabriolet Series 2. So any 250 convertible Ferrari is worth a lot of money. But this is the one that's in the original Pink Panther movie, and you don't see it till the end. Well, that car is missing. So the recent sale of a light car is anywhere from 3.4 to $4 million. Uh, let's see. It's supposedly silver with red interior. The forums show that it could be one of four different serial numbers. Last seen probably Paris, where the movie was filmed in the late 1960s. I would value this one anywhere between 4 and $6 million. All right, another movie car is coming up next. Our eighth car is the 1964 Goldfinger Aston Martin DB5, James Bond's Goldfinger. Uh, the last one that sold was another James Bond Goldfinger car. It sold for $6.4 million. It supposedly is here in Cincinnati. I haven't been able to see it. Uh, that one is here. The Goldfinger is even more iconic, so I'm going to peg this number between seven and eight million dollars. Uh, this one, interestingly enough, was last seen at an airport hangar in Boca Raton, Florida, and it disappeared in 1997. Now, since then, the Art Recovery International (ARI) organization was helped was hired by an unspecified unspec insurance firm to help track down the stolen Aston Martin. And it's rumored to be being held in the Middle East in one of those car collections. And there is a six-figure reward for information leading to a safe return. All right, number nine, James, James Dean's Porsche Spider 550. So these 550 Porsches sell for around 4 to $4.5 million. Uh, everybody knows the story. He was racing back in 19, I think it was 54. He wrecked his car, got killed. What's really weird about this is that the parts and pieces were kind of harvested from that wreck. And it went to George Barris, the customizer. And he gave it to a firm that used it to create awareness about highway safety. So, you know, it's not like the parts were scrapped. The parts were used for many years to scare kids to death about, you know, driving erratically or racing on the streets or whatever. And then it just disappeared. Now, if you listen to some of the car podcasts I listen to, apparently there's a group of dentists out in California that have, each one of them has like different parts of it. So I don't know that you'll ever see it fully intact again. But if you did, 
I would put it a price tag on it around eight million dollars. The next one, number ten, is the 1935 Duesenberg SSJ, once owned by Clark Gable. Duesenberg made two of these cars. The as I mentioned before, there were SJs. Well, this is the SSJ, which I believe it had twin superchargers. Anyways, there's two of them. Uh, the other one, owned by Gary Cooper, sold last year or the year before for $22 million. It was the highest price ever paid for an American car, and it was really cool. Like, it was unrestored, original. Uh, so the other one's missing. That was owned by Clark Gable. I don't believe it will be as original as unrestored because nobody knows where it is. It's probably, if, if found, will be in decrepit shape. So I would peg it at $15 million. All right, numbers 11 through 17. We're making a big jump right here. There are seven McLaren F1s that are missing. Now, the average Haggerty value for these is $16 million. The most recent sale was 15.6. If you count the, uh, what do you call them? The G, I'm sorry, the LM spec ones, the racing spec ones, I think one sold for almost $19 million. So apparently the Sultan of Brunei has quite the car collection, or at least he did in the 90s and early 2000s, so much so that when this, F1 came on the scene, he bought 10 of them. Now, they only made, I think, 106 in all. And so, of the 10, three of them surfaced. And now there's a question as far as where are the remaining seven. Now, what's cool about this is they're not just all road going cars. There's two road going cars, one in gray, which is the first production version of the car. So, that's got to be super rare. One in blue. The other F1s include three of the six LM spec cars. So there are six LM spec cars. Three of them are missing, the $18 million cars, in one of three GTs ever made. So not only are they rare for being McLarens, they're super rare because they're the spec LM spec cars or the GT cars. Now, so last seen as part of the collection of the Sultan of Brunei, they're probably rusting away, well, maybe not rusting, but dusting away in the desert in the mid 1990s is when they were last seen. So I would price these out at 15 to 25 million. And I don't think it'll matter what condition they're in when they are found, as long as they have the, all the original parts and the engine. All right. That bumps us up to number 18. We're getting close to the end here. This is the really big dollar cars. So this is the Ferrari 350. I'm sorry, Ferrari 375 MM chassis number 0378 AM. Now, these were built between 1953 and 1955, so I don't know what year the car is. Uh, let's see. The recent sales, one sold for $9 million in 2013. The ones that have sold since were kind of bitsas and sold for less, so I didn't quote those. But these are pure you know, racing cars from Ferrari in the 50s, a big 4.5-liter V12 engine. Uh, 26 were made. 25 are known where they are. And there's just one missing. So we have no idea where it is. We have no idea when it was last seen. So I would put the price on this high, 20 to $25 million, especially when you look at the Testarossas are now $30 million cars. The GTOs are $70 million cars. 20 to $30 million might actually be a little light. All right, two more to go. The 19th car of the 20 is the 1935 Bugatti Aerolith. 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 So there's no comps for this car. It's a one of one, I believe. It was a concept design by Mr. Bugatti himself. And it is, I believe it was made out of, oh, uh, what's, not aluminum, not metal, uh, magnesium, maybe? In one of the car shows out of Canada, I'm drawing a blank on the car show right now, they did a recreation. And they talked about how difficult it was to weld magnesium together the way they did it back in 1935. So I believe the last known location of this one was Paris in 1935, and it's probably worth upwards of $50 million if it is ever found. And the big winner, the most valuable car that is MIA, is another Bugatti, a 1936 Bugatti Atlantic Coupe, the black one, chassis 57453. No value comps on this. There are only four of them made. This is the one of the four that is missing it is. It was owned by Bugatti himself. Now it is, let's see, trying to see if there's any notes here. It's guessing that even in barn fine condition, it would be worth as much as $115 million. That is just nuts. So 
when you're looking in those barns for cool cars like I do all day, every day, as much as I possibly can, look for a Bugatti, would you? <laughs> or a Ferrari. I'm sure those are on your list. So thanks for joining me today. Thank you for all you that are out there listening to my ramblings about car stuff. Shoot me a note at gstanley at rmsethelbees.com or at greg at thecollectorcarpodcast.com. I will respond. It might take me a day or two because things are kind of nuts. But I appreciate all your support, and we will talk to you all next week. Thanks for listening to The Collector Car Podcast. Don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes, and be sure to follow us on Instagram and everywhere else at The Collector Car Podcast.